everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I'm not outside riding or running, I'm probably inside writing about it. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and you are here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we look at all different types of movements and the folks that do them and try and pull some of their their takeaways and best tips back to things that we do and, and the sports maybe we want to try. All right, that was solid. I've decided I have a new New Year's resolution for myself, though. I'm going to figure out a new intro to to open with. Is that like a new identity as well? New Year, new me. Yeah. You guys know me. Actually, if you check out the latest issue of Canadian Cycling Magazine, my uh, 2020 makeover montage article is in there. And while it sounds really goofy, it actually is a really good article with a bunch of different like step ups to you know different ways you can kind of quote unquote make over your your cycling in the new year none of it's really obnoxious or doofy so the new year's issue is already out yeah new year's issues always come out in early december i'm not used to these news cycles oh man yeah actually it's funny as i've been talking to a bunch of editors lately they're all we're all talking and they're like yeah so do you have any ideas for september of 2020 and i'm like i don't know where i'm gonna be in the world in september 2020 Right. Uh, but those articles are due in March. So a little behind the scenes publishing right. for our listeners. Uh, anyway. So we'll- we're in a power outage of sorts. We're away on vacation and basically in pitch dark uh, in Costa Rica. But uh, we thought this was a good time to f- answer some questions for the Q&A. Uh, do you have any other newsworthy items? Well, I was just going to say, it's funny because I'd been reading a book um, The Power of Less by Leo Babuda this morning, and it talks about, you know, not checking your email other than like twice a day. And it was kind of good timing to read it because at the moment we can't check our email. We're right. We're pretty stranded. It's It's a very cliche thing to be reading in Costa Rica. Oh my gosh, I know. Yeah. I know. I, I don't like me either. I'm not happy with me either. Right. Right. Well, what else is going on as you, you, you work away on vacation? What else do you have going on? Uh, just a bunch of Shred Girls stuff for Christmas, really. I'm working on a Shred Girls Christmas short story, so that's going to be coming out um, to people who are subscribed to the Shred Girls newsletter on December 20th. Of 2019. Of 2019. Uh, so you can get on that newsletter list at shred-girls.com. I also put a coupon code up for using the Shred Girls store for all the different Shred Girls t-shirts and towels and sweatshirts and actually these cute new bracelets that may or may not play a role in the short story. No spoilers. Right. And these a lot of the, the revenue goes towards supporting the, the Shred Girls website and getting that good information out there and, and encouraging and motivating yeah. m- more young women on bicycles. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, every time you're buying, you're basically just saying you want more stuff on this website to, you know keep getting more girls on bikes very very good any other new articles or anything i've been working on a ton lately we've had a lot of really good interviews and some actually i'm really excited about one that i'll have out on outside in the next couple weeks so i'll have to update the show notes but it's all about um basically the difference between a nutritionist or a registered dietitian or any of the various you know nutrition experts out there right um why you might need one you know how to pick how to choose one how to break down what all of those initials after or letters after names mean and sure what to do in an appointment to make the most out of it so that's been that's taken me a lot of time and interviews and work and i'm really excited with how that one's turned out very good very good what about you Uh, It's been good. A lot of good clients. You know, we got uh, a couple like one client was like a fat bike. They like climbed a hill they hadn't climbed before. So it's those, you know, it's not the world championships, but it's, you know, I get really excited about things like that. And uh, right now we're in sort of a lot of strength training for people. So some big weights, we're getting a lot of big weights up, you know, overhead and squatted and stuff. And uh, form seems to be coming along as well, which is important. So yeah, good time of year for for that so hopefully pay dividends as we go down the the path as it were yeah and you've been having a lot of chats with people about sort of 2020 goals and stuff yeah always trying to you know cycle in what are we trying to do and and sort of also just where are we right and and for i work with a lot of masters cyclists so it's it's always the the tricky bit of you know aging of injuries of you know balancing life and family and work uh, with those big scary goals. So yeah, trying to get that point A, point B and keep moving on the path. 
Yeah, and one of our questions today actually will kind of almost tie back into that, so we'll we'll kind of come back to that idea. Sure. But let's get into this week's questions. And just a reminder, if you have questions, you can find us at Peter Glassford, at Molly J. Herford, or consummateathlete.com. Yeah, and we do these about every two weeks. Yep. So hit us up with questions. So the first one, is there a heart rate equivalent for RPE? No, not really. Maybe explain what RPE is. So rate of perceived exertion. Uh, And so the idea is like, it's like, how hard does this feel, right? And so heart rate is like a, if you think about it, like a strain gauge is like how hard your body's working. Um, And that's going to be affected by a lot of things, as is perceived exertion, right? Uh, So you could be pedaling along outside and it's the nicest day ever and you're like peaking and you could feel like, oh, that was barely even hard but your heart rate might be like really, really high, right? And and it might be the best day ever or vice versa. It could be the worst day ever and it could feel really hard and your heart rate might be really depressed that day because you're really tired, right? That's normal in like a stage race or, you know, big training block maybe, or you just haven't slept. Mm -hmm. So heart rate's very subject to strain or the stressors that you're under. That could be, again, heat, altitude, no sleep, uh, coffee, Whereas perceived exertion, also affected by things, but differently. Um, uh, so yeah, so there, there isn't really necessarily. Um, you, you could certainly try and, and different types of the scales. You know, there's the one to 10, I guess, and then uh, the Borg scales to 18. Do you have any like rough ones? I think most people use one to 10. A lot so of people, yeah. Could the, you kind of, are there any zones for that that kind of are equivalent zones? Yeah, or? you could look that up. I mean, I don't need to necessarily read that to people, but yeah, you, certainly you'll see that like when you see like your power zones and they'll, they'll like try and equate that to heart rate, which again has issues, but they sort of correlate. Um, so, I mean, it, it's not rocket science, right? Like your sort of max, you know, your sprint efforts, your VO2 efforts, they're going to be up in that, you know, 9, 10 mm-hmm. type thing. Your thresholds, you know, maybe that's going to be more in that sort of six to eight type thing maybe some tempo is dipping into that six um and and down from there right so it's it's close and you could maybe do like percentages but that's not the point right and so the 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 simple answer is like no like you have to be in tune with how you're feeling and that's that's why we do that i think that's actually the point i was going to make is just it's so easy now with so many gadgets and it's so like there's just so many sensors that you can attach to yourself that you actually end up completely detached from how something actually feels. Uh, that's actually really scary to me. Yeah, and you sort of with everything, right? Like you'll get the polls where we're like doing AI and there's like a computer and you have like numbers in your sunglasses and, mm-hmm. you know, it's telling you the perfect wattage and, and you know, all, it's not uncommon for clients to be like, tell me what wattage to do in this this like power test, right? And it's like, well, that's not the point of the test. Like if right. I if I tell you I'm either going to like ruin your day by telling you too much or undershoot, right? Like you're gonna you're just gonna see what the training's done, um, and so a lot of this gets back to just training consistently, not maximally, but submaximally, and you start being able to triangulate what that's like, and then you test, which is just a practice. It's just a a workout where you get to to do this, right? Yeah, I think it's just self-knowledge i guess is super important to me so i don't know which do you think like do you think perceived exertion is more important than heart rate or i mean i think most of us will race um and do group rides and stuff much more by feeling right and i Mm -hmm. think that feeling is is often the way right that's the whole basis really of uh hutchinson's book endure we did a podcast with him as well you can look up which was really good um certainly a lot of fitzgerald stuff with brain training is is based around this idea of perceived exertion um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's huge, right? And it's getting used to dealing with high exertion, which again is sort of getting to this thing is we think that if we know like the exact wattage we need to hold, but at some point there's just no getting around that like you just need to get really good at dealing with discomfort, right? I talk about like keeping your hand in the fire. Some people, the second they feel the heat, they like take their hand out, right? And they're not the, the really good racers. The people who are really good at racing can get into that red zone or into the fire and they can hold their hand for the record, Peter is not suggesting this as a training technique. No, Hutchinson does talk about that in his book, though. If you want to know more about like putting your hand in like hot water and stuff, as a it apparently didn't transfer over as well as you would think or hope. But I don't feel like that would translate over at all. 
Well, I mean, it's all painful, right? So the thought was that if you could deal with pain, you would deal with pain on your bicycle or running. But... There's so many arguments against that, but... Yeah, so I think it's the, the message really is just to, you know, make sure you are sort of like, okay, how hard does should this feel? I'm doing a threshold interval today. Should this be like full out maximal or should this be more like... You know, there should be a little, I always say like a gear more, right? You should be able to accelerate. If, mm-hmm. you, if someone said, now it's time to actually race, you should be able to right? And then endurance, again, should be back from that. It shouldn't feel like you're racing um, or, or doing tempo, right? There's, you know, so just try and reflect what you're trying to do. And that may evolve over the workout, right? There's certainly, you're going to get tired, right? Like I gave this client the analogy of like that 20 minute is going to feel different in a one hour workout versus a five hour if you did it at the end of a five hour, right? Yeah, I think the the last thing I'll add is, I think it's really good for people to occasionally, like even if you're recording heart rate data, just cover it, like don't have it showing on your screen Mm -hmm. and actually try to do your workouts by perceived exertion. Because I think it's really easy to confuse your brain if you look down and see your heart rate is like up or down. Mm -hmm. Like it changes your perception of your perception of effort. Yeah, yeah, and heart rate, I, I really like. I would say I'm a heart rate advocate, but I also use power and perceived exertion. But, you know, heart rate's really good if you're doing intervals. You can sort of get a decent idea if the strain's being maintained if you just are always sort of hitting about the same heart rate during the interval or, right. or higher. Um, and if the heart rate's dropping, then the strain is dropping. So then you're sort of like, okay, well, how much, you know, that probably wasn't the idea. So heart rate's interesting for that perspective. It's interesting to like limit your effort. We'd use that more in like an endurance or tempo type effort probably or recovery, I guess. Right. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's important to do a bit of both like you're suggesting. You know, maybe even in a workout, you could do a three minute interval with power and then watch what happens to the heart rate. And then you could use heart rate and then you could use perceived exertion. Usually if it's if it's getting over like that moderate, that threshold sweet spot where you maybe are concerned about limiting your effort a bit, uh, then I often will just go by feeling. And I might look at the lap average power, but if I'm using the same hill as well, like you know how far up the hill you need to get. Mm-hmm. So then it's very much like th- those to me, those VO2 efforts, those anaerobic efforts, they'll be very much about like sitting with the discomfort and like keeping yourself pushing right and it doesn't really matter the wattage right but you can check a lap average before you hit lap and you can also see how far you go up the hill this is just peter's like pulpit for being like hit the lap button people i'm a big advocate of the lap button okay anyway on the topic of endurance pace this is one we've kind of come across a bunch of times but someone finally specifically asked it uh what do i do if i can't run at endurance pace Right, or, or you'll see this a lot of times with math, like the Phil Maffetone method, where it's sort of roughly 180 minus your age, or just, I always say like sort of somewhere between like 140 and 150 for a lot of us is sort of that aerobic threshold, maybe you might call it. Um, but yeah, your zone two even, right? Like some people, when we're starting cycling even, it'll be hard to run under, you know, in the endurance zone, however we want to define this and whichever tribe or whatever you want to call it, whichever that's not the word I want, but what is the, like, whichever party you're jumping in with. Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember on the bike a few years ago having a really hard time riding at MAF because my legs would actually give up before. Because it was too hard. Yeah. So that's like a separate, that does happen on the bike. Often. And then yeah. running, I remember when I first started, I mean, I guess I was 20, so maybe this actually was, maybe I was running perfectly at MAF, but I remember thinking, like, I could just never get my heart rate, like, under 160 if I was running. Yeah, it and so it's actually hard. so. The caveat is that if you're under, I don't remember how it might not be twenty, but there is a point where it's you just use one sixty, um, which is challenging for a lot of people to to move forward under one sixty. Uh, so the question is, what do you do? I guess. Um, so I would just double check that there is still variety in your week. Like there's an off day, an easier, longer day. Uh, maybe some sort of like interval or strides or or something like that um and and go from there i think the strides you know we've had david roshan talking about strides it's a big part of what you're saying you'd slow down enough that it does some days yeah And, and we'll talk about strategies for that in a second but i just a lot of people they'll run at 165 or whatever and they're like i just can't run under 160 but it, they run every single day at 165 so there's just no variation so even leaving should we do our training slowly 
the the first tenet of training is that there should be some sort of variety right 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 i think we pretty much all agree with that there should be some variation within the week and duration intensity right um from there your question is okay i can't move like i have to walk so i would say that's probably fine some days you could do a run walk so run until the heart rate hits math or or the endurance limit walk for a bit you know you could do that by heart rate you could do it by time whatever i think there's no reason you couldn't do hiking uphill um, for your long day to start you could probably mix in some cross training i think would be good and then just ignore that and do like even walk runs with like full gas strides because i think some of the element with running that we're missing is like the neuromuscular like you could call it form or just the elasticity in the tissues and that has to adapt as we get going but it's very hard to like just do that with endurance at some point you need to go quickly right and develop form and i think this would be a good question for david but i think you would see like in probably four weeks if someone started doing strides with like some walking and hiking and then you know their best their best effort at trying to run slowly um i would imagine you'd start seeing things improve Um, the only other thing i'd probably add in would be some strength training um again to try and go after a bit of that neuromuscular um piece uh do you have anything else that i think if you're if you're trying to run slow enough that your heart rate is dipped into that endurance zone and that's like your struggle one thing I would actually suggest is covering your watch where you're seeing pace or distance sure. and just looking at time and heart rate. If that's the goal, right? Yeah, because I think if you're trying to run at that pace, it's really, really, really disheartening if you know, you're know you used to running at that like 165 beats, you usually would do like a you know eight and a half minute mile, for instance. And then when you yeah. drop to like 150, suddenly you're at like an 11 minute mile, like that's that's really hard to handle. And if, you're, if you've been seeing that for years, you know, 8.30 is your pace. To drop, you know, significantly, I think is really mentally challenging. So I would just sure. cover up the pace and- Well, and sometimes we have, uh, I was gonna say the exact same. There's lots of people that run at like six minute kilometers. I don't know, that's probably what you're talking about. Give or take, Miles yeah. pace, we're trying to cover the bases here. Um, you know, so there's a lot of like people who probably their zone two would not be as fast as they're running they're trying to run like 430s because that's the only pace like that's an acceptable running pace maybe feels good and fast Um, but people like you can run slower than that Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one piece is just what are what are the rules you're you're trying to put in what are the should statements right sometimes we have like all these should statements like it needs to be a 430 but it also needs to be under 140 bpm right i think trails actually help a lot with this too because they kind of alleviate the straight road that you're going down well, you never would even care right? yeah you just wouldn't it's really like think interesting about it. but like you're seeing like eight to a, what 10 11 sometimes yeah not, for, it, for the kilometer yeah. yeah it forces you to slow down so that was a piece um the should statements is a really good one i like that um yeah i don't know oh the dietary piece so especially with the math like there's a big dietary piece math is big on like health and that's like his theory is that the math tests that he has the pace um your aerobic pace should improve as you become more of a a fat burner you might say right so as you improve the diet maybe remove some sugar you know this should in theory help you become better in in this sense this is not like a low car i mean phil mavitone might argue otherwise but i don't think either of us are saying Uh, low carb no and i think that's again i think we need to look at like what the goal is but i I do think that sometimes we like miss out on like you know we're not we're just not eating very well and this is a good practice for health this is a good practice for endurance right to be like you know maybe we could pull out some of those stressful foods you know the alcohols and like the the low-hanging you know we know what junk food is right so if it is like you know there's definitely like some candy you know really sugar-laden beverages and you know alcohol you know we we have some some low-hanging fruit we could probably pull out there uh that might actually help your running pace which would be really neat right and don't believe me try it for 30 days and and just see like this is your math like dietary you know trial you're going to see like can you get faster at running by running slowly quote unquote slowly and you know taking out some of those low hanging things right mm-hmm. interesting experiment i'd love to hear if anyone tries it okay i like it um on the topic of eating though um fasted state long workouts in order to lose weight um 
I think I'm just going to shout from the rooftops no to start that. Yeah, it's tough. Like, I, I'm like, people have been running. Like, I think we might have answered another question recently about this. Like, people have been running in the morning without eating for a long time. Yeah. But usually it's like, you know, not your most intense, most quality session of the week, and it's not excessively long for you, whatever well, there that were, means. There were two words in that question that indicated it's not an easy morning run, and that would be a long workout. Yeah, yeah. And I think this one was like sort of a moderate one, too. Um, so I think we just need to be careful, like, what is the goal? If the goal is a health goal, then we might be more in that, like we were just talking about, the Maffetone method and diet and stuff might be a good place to just play around. Um, but the, it's not super long and it's not super hard, um, but there's a big dietary component. Um, so, th so that could be a strategy. But to me, what happens is your body gets like really stressed because it's, it's getting so depleted and then afterwards, usually it's like you're really hungry. Um, and, and that's the trick with endurance, right? Like I think a lot of times we think that it, the endurance training is the way to um, really crazy leanness because we see like Tour de France people. Um, but, you know, we're not all 24-year-old men mm -hmm. uh, in that case. And, and I think it's, it's tough, right? I think things like, you know, again, those low-hanging fruit, some good quality strength training, working on, you know, strength and mobility. Yeah, I mean, I think the only the only ways to me fasted anything makes sense for endurance athletes or athletes in general are, yeah, the short, so like sub 30, very easy morning workouts. So that's a spin, a walk, a run, something like that, yoga, yeah, whatever. I think that's great. And then it's probably, probably before breakfast. I, I mean, I think there's good, that makes good sense to me. It's not so far from your last meal. Yeah, exactly. So that's great. And then I think, I, I did an article for Outside on intermittent fasting about a year ago, and it was really interesting kind of talking through that. And I think we, we put a really sexy label on intermittent fasting, but really like the, the best one for athletes is, you know, a 12 to 14 hour fast, which could be... This is like sun up to sundown. Yeah, it's yeah. basically, you know, you start eating at 7 a.m., you stop at 7 p.m. That's 12 hours where yeah. you're mostly asleep. Yeah, it's funny. Like when I when I tell people like, okay, 7.30 is like we're done eating. And again, like family, like we can adjust this. But in general, we'll try and be done at 7.30. Um, yeah, it's like, no. Can't but then it. like for sure we're going to do intermittent fasting for 24 hours or something right and it's just this like odd switch that we like again jump to extremes when i think you know to this question you know if we're going to do a long workout that's long for us so this is my long three four hour workout on the weekend i'm going to fuel that because it's challenging me and i want my output to be better because that's the the thing here is we acknowledge that the fasted workout is going to be higher RPE, which we just talked about. We all know what that means now. And it's going to be lower output. Right. So it's going to feel harder, but you're going to do worse if Crappier. you don't eat. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be hard. And, and there could be benefits. There's lots of studies out there looking at, you know, high intensity interval training with fasted. But we need to be careful that we've, we've not gone past the basics. Like, do we have variety in our week? So the variety might be you wake up and do a morning run or a morning spin for 30 minutes or something. Great. That's some variety. But then we also have fueled workouts, which just is where the evidence is that there's definitely fueled workouts. And those might be the intensity ones. Those might be that long, burly tempo workout or something um, or the long weekend workout. But there might be, you know, low intensity. That's really not a big deal and is your normal and your body's very comfortable doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the place. Like, I think looking at it for me, what is a very, very like within my capacity type workout um, and that might be the place to go. But I would keep a, if weight loss is the goal, I'd keep a really close eye on how that affects you in the like 24 hours after. Mm -hmm. I think we can also say, I th we've both seen a lot of people, and I mean, I'll include myself in this, who've done the, yeah, not fueling enough in a workout in like the attempt to lose weight. But then ultimately you actually end up gaining weight because you're hungrier after, like you're eating at the wrong time. Now you're like eating a ton at night. So you're, you're not fueling for the training, but you end up like over fueling. And that's how people even get in trouble with red S, right? Like it's not necessarily yeah, that no, you're- There's no energy availability. Yeah, yeah, you're not actually calorically deficient, but you don't have the energy availability when you need the energy. Yeah, and so again, it gets, what is the goal? Who are you? What are you trying to do, right? And so if it's like, okay, no, weight loss is like a big focus, then this might mean a different type of workout, different type of nutrient 
our nutrition strategy for sure, right? And, and we're going to be focused on that. That's a, a sort of health-oriented goal. Yeah, so this is actually something that came up a bunch in my nutrition and RD article that I was working on recently, is a lot of people kind of have this like a secret goal of wanting to lose weight, but then they like kind of... Um, I mean, make, we probably all have this goal on some level. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But you try to make it more palatable by saying, "I want to be fast," or "I want to, you know, put on muscle," or something like this. Um, but the RD that I was talking to, her argument for that is, okay, but that's a totally different goal, and we would approach that in a completely different way. So, if you're saying that you want to be fast and you want to win a race, but really you actually just want to lose 15 pounds, yeah, like those are two completely different goals. Even if you know you might think that they're going to be kind of similar like they're not yeah and like i, I gave you like if i wanted to get really lean like I, you would train like a, a bodybuilder right which is you know a lot of time in the gym like very heavy dietary component to it right and, and not necessarily like much in the way of like the endurance that we all want to do mm -hmm. right? it's not necessarily the way um, and I think that's like we put such a reliance on exercise and I I am my that's my full bias with kinesiology is that exercise is the way but the the evidence is not so much there right so I think just making sure that we're before we go into any crazy fasted things on or off bike or otherwise just like again is there alcohol sugar drinks you know chocolate in the house like have we cleaned out the pantry are we cooking at home frequently you know are we enjoying our meals um, you know getting in sleep the sleep's a big 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 portion right so yeah hopefully something there <laughs> all right perfect oh can we link to your intermittent fasting though if people want to read that was a good one and that one had like rob wolf yeah did he get in on yep. it yeah that's so that's really really good and he's very much on the side of intermittent fasting but put in some good caveats that sort of i think support basically what we're saying here mm -hmm. so we can probably link to that yep yeah that okay cool Sweet. All right. Next one. Um, winter racing apparel. So basically how to dress for winter races. So racing, not, yeah. not riding. Yeah. Right. So I love this because we were just at Pan Am's and Canadian Nationals and the variety in clothing from like racer to racer was huge. But I would say the front of the pack was all kind of dressed in one way and towards the back of the pack was dressed in another way. Yeah, and it's chicken or the egg with that, right? So, I mean, I'm going to quote the the great Jeremy Powers. Yeah, hopefully he would back this. I don't know if this quote I've just taken and ran with it. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Do you want me to say it or are you yeah, saying it? You can say oh, it. Okay, you it's your favorite. Um, yeah, so he told me that if you're going to win the race, you can't wear leg warmers. And this is somewhat simplified into a specific thing. But what I took it to mean is that, like, if you overdress, then you're obviously not racing. Um, so especially for something like cyclocross, because there's different types of winter racing, right? My, my Manitoba clients are laughing at us here talking about our, our, our leg warmers, you know, when they're fat biking and negative 30 and, and commuting to work and stuff. Um, but with the cyclocross like i think you need to be on the the chillier side when you want to be exerting yourself really really hard right you should be quite cold in the minute before the race when you have to take off your coat and hand it to someone yeah and it's almost like i, I this is a jeff kabush but like he, he said something to the fact that like if your bike makes it to the finish line it was too heavy right and so there's like a wisdom in there somewhere where it's you know you you want your bike to be really light but you also don't want it to break till you finish Right? Yeah, but you basically want to be like that movie, like jalopy car collapsing on the finish line, mm -hmm. right? I guess, or maybe just after, so your sponsors are happy. I guess um, it doesn't collapse on TV. But all that to say, you want to sort of have enough that like you can move freely and you can generate as much work, which is heat, as you can, right? So it's it's this like tough, tough thing, this balance, right? And I think it's different. Like I tend to run colder. So I always used to like try and wear like a jersey and then a vest, or I do a base layer, a jersey, a vest, and then a jersey just to try and stay warm. Yeah. And I never overheated, but I think you have to be like, just careful that you're, you're, you're at that like limit of the second you, you know, you're, you're almost getting cold, right? Yeah. Okay. So a few, so a few caveats. It's not the leg warmers are necessarily evil, however, if you've ever seen a race where someone towards the, probably towards the back, I'm just gonna say, has the leg warmer that's starting to sag, you get the like two inches of thigh between like the skin suit and the bottom of the leg warmer, 
That is not winning you any races. And I think probably the way he would would phrase it if he if he ever came on the podcast for us mm. uh, would be that like I think indeed as you're saying like leg warmers aren't practical because of when they get wet and muddy and stuff they t- I was gonna, tend to roll down. I, I was going to add a practical caveat though. But he would so he would be suggesting you run bare legs to race or full tights and there's a like a degree sort of like a, a, you know it gets to under zero say or under negative five then you would wear full tights to race or on like yes and he actually would have the like full onesie skin suits for sure right and i mean you know there are some people who have leg warmers that are good enough that they actually stay up i was actually just talking to Megaly rochette about this back sure at pan Am's. Like, that's how i did it too it's fine if you do have slippy leg warmers though hot tip safety pin them Safety pin them in place. You could, yeah. So I want to back up, though, because, like, a lot of us aren't winning races. I certainly don't win many. Uh, so then the question is, like, how do you, like, what are some rules of thumb here? We want to keep this somewhat on, not so much. We're just quoting people randomly. So winter racing, we're going to run less than we would train in. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Um, is there any other sort of, like... Well, I think for cyclocross specifically, which I know is the person who asked this question is definitely in the cyclocross field, although I want to, you know, talk about fat biking and stuff too. But for cyclocross specifically, I think we place a lot of importance on wearing a skin suit because that's what the pros do. It's what the pros do in Europe where it's like 50 degrees at races. It's really not that cold. So to me, I would actually, if I was racing in nationals, next weekend or this coming weekend i guess in washington in washington state state. i remember you know i raced in bend oregon for nationals back in like 2012 and it was freezing and i was miserable because i was in a skin suit and leg warmers that actually fell down Mm. Uh, like i finished with a leg warmer around my ankles what i would do now is i would wear thermal bib tights or even just thermal or just uh just bib tights not thermal depending on just how cold it was full length tights bibs so they don't come down with a long sleeve jersey like i think we get in this thing with cyclocross where we have to have a skin suit Mm. and i don't think that that is the case for most of us especially until someone's giving you those yeah yeah i think that makes sense i think maybe there's if we back out again there's like warming up well the warm-up's going to be important so that you're warm and then you have like a big coat that you can put on and throw off certainly like as you said at nationals pan ams there was coats flying everywhere right before the start and then you're starting to like cold for a minute but then you're you're in there and then you hopefully heat up um the other piece i think is just like this is where it gets back to you know the testing question we started with um or the heart rate perceived exertion right this is all practice this is all what i call gameplay hopefully we can gameplay you know if you're racing cyclocross you've been like out preparing right and not just on the trainer this is part of the reason i have so much problem with smart trainers is you know we need to be out practicing this um so it might be doing intervals in the cold right like before we left for costa rica uh i was you know we had a bit of winter weather in november uh in canada and i went out and did hill intervals and it was like massive coats because i'm very cold all the time uh threw off my coat got warmed up really well threw off my coat side of the road hit it and then intervals up and down the hill chilly on the way down good on the way up and then coat back on road home Right. And so it's just getting used to that. What do I need when I'm doing a similar amount of effort outdoors? And you sort of figure yourself out, right? Yeah. Um, And then two last things from the neck up. Um, A lot of people opt to wear like caps under their helmets. You will get so overheated with that. I also, from a mountain biking perspective, the cap gets like, even if you flip up the brim, it gets in the way when you're going down hills. Mm. I almost wonder if there was like people at Pan Am's and Pan Am's. Yeah. Pan Am's had a mud shoot. And I almost wonder how many people were having issues with caps. Uh, but yeah, I would say, I don't know what this is like, uh, beanies, not caps. I don't even go, I honestly wouldn't even go beanie. Like, I think unless it's in the negatives, you don't need a hat. You're going to get so hot. I started wearing, we got it for Iron Man. So this was like a failing forward with equipment, I guess. But we got like an aero helmet. So you see the aero helmets and there's probably cyclocross specific ones. That, the one thing that got really trendy a couple years ago was plastic, like plastic caps covers. that went over. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like a, an unvented helmet yeah. might, might help there. But I think you could do like a light beanie. But again, this is like, you have to figure out like if you're a person that just like <laughs> gets super warm, right? Or if you have long hair, like if you have a lot of hair, if you have enough hair to put help. in a ponytail, you probably don't need that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this relates to gloves would be another thing. Like I think very common is having like 
three sets of gloves type thing. Um, and you know, you have like your warm up gloves, you have like your gloves to keep you like really, really warm and toasty. And then you'd have like race gloves. Um, and I, and I would imagine this is where the people with the always riding barehanded and not liking gloves, it becomes an issue when we're into this winter racing, right? Sure. You lose was, a lot of that dexterity. Yeah. I was also going to say on the head though, I had two points. Oh, okay. Uh, clear lenses on glasses when it's grim out you tend to think you don't need sunglasses because no sun glare um but your eyeballs get super super cold well and mud and mud yeah but yeah clear lenses it's such a game changer because then you you know you're not like blinking through rain you're not getting ice in your eye in fact it's just really uncomfortable when your eyes are freezing also if anyone listening is in the business of like clear plastics that are sticky I'd like to talk to them. I, I want to get tear-offs like they have in motocross for cycling. What? So in motocross, you can like, when you're up, they usually do it when they're up in the air. So it's like really cool. And then they grab like, there's a strip of plastic that goes across their goggles. The goggles are fastened to their head. So it's a little better than sunglasses. Um, but you could make sunglasses that also had a band, I guess. And so they like go up in the air and they like take one hand off their handlebars and they like grab a little like tab and pull a clear piece of plastic off the lens and then it's clean again oh so like every lap in a muddy race they could be like pulling and you get yeah brand yeah new. someone should probably make yeah i've always us. wondered why no one had had figured this out so if anyone wants to go into business uh, i'll be the idea man yep yep uh last question so i really like leg warmers i don't like my knees being uncovered um so if i'm gonna stick with jeremy powers thing i'm absolutely not buying or racing in winter tights uh, what what type of option do we, do I have? Well, this leads to our yeah next question of WTF is Embro, Embro embrocation. Uh, so basically, it is a spicy gel. That's the best way well, I can describe it. Not a it. gel you eat. Important. Do not People eat it. People have gotten into trouble with that. Do not mix it up with chamois cream. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the companies that make chamois cream also make an embrocation. Yeah. Do not mix those two so up. So it's like a warming oil for your legs. I think most of them use capsaicin. So the so same like stuff. Like a pep, hot chili pepper. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is that you put it on your legs. It usually smells delicious or obnoxious depending on your definition and yeah you put it on and it it indeed warms the skin yeah weirdly enough usually only after it gets wet okay so should people spray themselves with a hose yeah seems counter to staying warm no but a lot of people complain because they put the embrocation on their legs they race it doesn't really do anything (laughs) in the race and then they like go to spray down their legs you know they're muddy or whatever or they get in the shower after and that's when the burn comes yeah i've never been big on it but i remember people like traveling with them and then like after the race people like (laughs) screaming into the the, yeah or not into the microphone I'm, i'm talking into microphone but yeah, so I have the expertise here. I've spent a lot more years in the cyclocross circuit, so a couple things you need to know about embrocation. Uh, one, patch test it first. There is a chance that you will react badly to Maybe it. Maybe in training. Yeah. Two, uh, do not do it the same day you've shaved your legs. Uh, that will hurt like a mother. Uh, right. Three, apply using either a plastic bag or a like latex glove that you can throw out. By the way... When we were first dating, one of our first, we actually traveled to a race together, I guess as one of our, it'd be like our fourth date or something. Um, And I saw you do that and I was like, this woman is a genius and will probably keep me alive. (laughs) I had no idea. Yeah, you applied it with a Ziploc baggie and then you told me to take the Ziploc baggie and get rid of it. Yep. There you go. Okay. So that's also how you apparently get your man. If you need it, if you need it activated, sprinkle some water on your legs. Honestly, like a spray bottle, like you would like a cat. Yeah, that would actually be genius. It will get it going. Uh, if it's a rainy race, you're fine. Um, taking it off. Um, oh, also, also, make sure you put it on when you're pretty much ready to go. Not if you have to pee again or anything like that, because there's always a chance that you're going to accidentally like pull down your bib shorts, pull it up, and get it a little too high up on your thighs. Um, when you're trying to take it off, don't just jump in the shower. Uh, suds up a washcloth with dish soap, like a grease cutting dish soap. Don't try to use your fancy bar soap in the shower. Don't try to use a shower gel. Dish soap. 
it's the, like the only thing that's going to cut through it. I think also good for poison ivy. So you may as well just yeah. keep uh, some sunlight soap or something yeah. in there. If sunlight wants to sponsor the podcast. Also great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but embrocation, fantastic. Works really well in some situations. Not everyone loves it, but always worth trying, especially if you're someone who really doesn't like leg warmers and you know finds they want to have bare legs. And honestly, for wet races, when you know you're just going to be soaked in a minute anyway, and you're, you know, once your clothes get soaked, it doesn't matter if you're wearing leg warmers. They're just dead right. weight. Okay. Well, I think that's, I think embrocation is very much on the side of like, you should probably just play with this one Saturday when you're doing your like race specific workout. Um, I know I've meant to for about 10 years plus, just haven't done it. So I haven't used it in the race, right? Cause I just don't want to be that guy crying Yep. on the finish line. Cause it probably will happen anyhow. Yep. So with that said, we have one final question. Yeah. This one seems big. This one seems really big, but I love it. Okay. Um, budgeting tips for 2020 racing, training, and gear. She's trying to be more organized heading into the year. So where would you start? I mean, okay, first of all, I'm just going to start by saying I love this question because I don't think many people think about this. till it's too late, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I would start with a pretty big assessment. So I'd probably do this in a spreadsheet or, a, you know, big notepad, whatever. I would start by just thinking through what gear I currently have, what state it's in, and then what I think that I need. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with just gear because that's kind of the easiest spot to start. Uh, so I think a lot of people get in the thing of I need new running shoes, I need a new bike, I need a new wheel set, I need new everything. Um, I would say if you are on a budget, A, there's great companies like Protested Gear and Pro's Closet and all of those that actually sell secondhand gear that's really nice. So you don't always need to go shiny and new. Um, second, a lot of bikes can last a few years with just some minor upgrades. You might just need new tires and a new chain and you know maybe new handlebar tape or something like that. Um, so I think really being practical about what gear you currently have and you know what you can actually keep for a year is a pretty big place to start because I mean, the three grand that you could easily spend on a new bike could basically fund your racing season. Yeah, as, as far as race entries and stuff, for sure. So if you have um, a decent bike, you can probably just, you know, funnel that money into your your race season. Yeah, and I think there's so much good stuff now, like with aluminum. Like I know Trek has uh, aluminum versions of pretty much every bike mm -hmm. now, and some of them are super nice, super light, and you can get better components then. And I mean, ultimately, like the components and the wheels are the, the big part uh, so, I mean, I think there's th that type of option too, aside from used um, or using stuff for a second year. So I, I think that's a great idea. And then also like, what's the, what's the gear that you're using on the regular, like gels and stuff like that? Is there stuff that you can replace with cheaper options? Could you make some of your ride food? Um, well, or, or just use less gels, right? Like it's yeah. not that gels are bad, but no. you, they're bad if we use them for every meal, right? We probably agree with that. So those are the two poles. Um, I, I keep saying two pulls. I don't think I'm finishing it, but like there's that and there's not using it. And we're not saying don't use it, but you know, use it for the key workouts as your race approaches and then use it in the race, right? Like we want to game play that nutrition, just like our, our Embro, mm -hmm. um, but maybe save some money that way too. Right. And, and just, you know, bring a sandwich or a piece of fruit. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then racing is the big one. So the first thing I would do is basically make your, your wish list for 2020, um, you know, what are the races that you would love to do this year? Like the realistic races you want to do this year. And then we're going to get even more realistic. We actually talked through this last, last night as we were looking at the questions. A lot of people want to do races. They're on the bucket list that just don't really correspond with where they are in life. You have teachers who want to do... Well, point A, point B, and where we are right now versus, right? Yeah. It's a long ways. So like teachers who want to do, uh, you know, a race that's at the end of September or I mean, even at the end of August when ramp up time is starting or, right. you know, someone who is having a baby in March and wants to be racing, well, or is pregnant, yeah, yeah, racing a huge stage race by June 
or yeah, when we talked like accountants in April, um, you know, just parents with December. There's, yeah. there's lots of these times of the year where it's sort of like we go into maintenance phase, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so looking through the calendar of races that you really want to do in 2020 and like just X off the ones that are in any of those times that just don't really make sense for you if you're honest. Yeah, and it's tough. Like I've had some tough d- discussions with people, right? Because we want to do it and we want to do it now, but it could be, it's not a no, but it's, you know for all these reasons maybe we have an illness an injury that we're dealing with like it, it just might be that the progression is is a little longer term we have a dream goal a future goal um of something like you know a big goal whatever name your race um but this year might be just working towards that you know game playing it with some local races that are maybe a bit cheaper or you know whatever right maybe just doing like i had one client message me today and he they did this massive trip and like that was his big thing for the summer he didn't race at all and then had the cyclocross race season of his life um and he didn't race all summer and he said he missed it but like he had like they did some big california bike tour and jazz festival and well maybe that's almost kind of the other point as far as adding in training to this equation uh I guess what why are you racing are you doing these ser- like a local series because all of your friends are at it in which case like okay racing might actually be the thing that makes you happy or are you the kind of person who'd rather just have like one or two big races on the calendar for the year and then actually focus more of your time and money onto training for those two races yeah and i think that's the tricky bit right like when we start getting towards the the pointier end of the stick for us so like closer to that like i'm really you know for some people like the the nine hour belt buckle at leadville or or whatever right the there's lots of whatever the like the tough thing for you is um you know, you're just gonna have to tighten stuff up really hard right and the gameplay the the training the consistency it, it becomes bigger right people talk about iron man but i don't think it's that much different for a master's age person you know we only all have so many hours and you know, you can only push so much out of our bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we're racing every week, it's tough. Yeah. So you think making sure, yeah, like all of your race goals then are actually supported by your training. So, you know, if you have five races and that's going to tap your budget completely, so now you can't afford the, the gym membership if you need that, or you can't, you know, afford the physical therapist that you you wanted to work with or stuff like that that's sure that's well, not you're a trade stressed off. or you need to yeah. work, work more i guess too oh, would be sure. the other way to look at the budgeting side of thing like it could be a less a lower budget right and you just put less into it um but yeah i think if, if you sort of block out the busy times of year so that you're not stressed not getting sick not getting injured you can do a maintenance sort of like lower intensity lower volume period um and then take care of whatever life you know thing that month or time needs then you pick out those two bigger races we'll say and then there might be like a couple races that support that or are fun or local ones you like really want to do or that you help with um and i think you're just careful right like we've talked about just limiting the number of races a lot of times the number is really high yeah, um, I found especially now with social media and stuff like I definitely get you know FOMO when I see people uh, yeah, racing we have on like the weekend. a discussion. I completely understand where people get it, like with now with Instagram and people signing up for lotteries and. But the funny thing is, I don't actually really enjoy racing that much, like that frequently. Like I really thrive with like two or three races a season, and like I'm good. But then I just get convinced that I need to do 18 other races because other people are doing them. Well, and maybe that. So maybe some people aren't you and maybe they like racing Mm -hmm. so maybe that's that person if we're talking budgets then maybe that person is the person who's like well i really want these experiences and these challenges and i like racing a lot okay more more power to them then maybe that is the person who's like well i'm just gonna like sell some of this gear and stick with this bike just get a new drivetrain for the year or you know whatever new tires and chain and away you go Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe that's boom like now you can do the the races right and so i think it's that balance sheet that i'm always talking about where it's like you have your bike gear your assets there they're not really assets but you have your bike gear and then what you need and then you have your races and then we've sort of like thrown some races out because we have hectic times of the year um and then maybe you start seeing those balancing a bit more. Yeah. No, I like that. And then I think the last thing I'll add as far as like budget for training and stuff, if you have had a few years where you're racing, you're just like not meeting your racing goals, 
it might be time to shift some of the budget into training. And I mean, you know, that might mean a coach, that might mean a bike fit, that might mean a training camp. There, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can end up spending a lot of money on training. And I'm not saying you need to do all of those things or any of those things. Well, but or, or less, right? I guess in your, we'll, we'll close this with your, your whatever your less book was. Um, but yeah, it might be that sometimes that's like, I found that personally, I, I don't know if it's getting older or, you know, being married now and work getting, you know, busier, which is great. I love coaching and, and doing that, but it's like, it's a lot. Like I'm staring at a computer and out with people a lot and it's, you know, there's only so much time in the day and energy and uh, we need to mitigate that. And I, so I found I've been able to keep racing as good, if not better than like maybe 10 years ago. Um, but you're doing less races overall less races and less tra traveling to race for sure yeah yeah and just what is the one or two and just showing up fully focused and just trying to shift life as much as i can in the, the week or so ahead uh just to try to get recovered right but mm -hmm. yeah maybe we should do a whole episode on sort of money saving for all of this like health and fitness stuff because i feel like over the years we've come up with a whole lot of ways to make all of these things from you know nutrition to travel to training a lot more cost effective so if anyone's interested in that or has any specific questions around that hit us up you can find us over at consummateathlete.com or at molly j herford or at peter glassford uh, but for now i think we'll sign off so enjoy the rest of your week anyone heading to u.s cyclocross nationals this weekend good luck and crush it